All right, so before we started the recording, I went out and opened a file called Import Employees SQL. You can find that in the RDD folder on OneDrive. I brought that in. Looks like this, just a bunch of commands that I was just explaining. I wrote a program to generate this because this is just a string, right? Just a bunch of text. And then I used a random number generator to randomly pick cities, randomly pick days, randomly pick costs, etc. Now all of this is in the screen. I can run all of these commands at once by clicking the lightning bolt. And it looks like, what's going on here? There it is. And it says can't do it again because I already executed it. So now I have all this data in there. Remember when we launch these things that they don't always show up over here right away, so I'm going to do a refresh. And now there's my employees table or database, excuse me, here are the tables. There's a table of employees, the plants that they work at. We're not going to be using states, but I include it here in case you need it. This is a table that you could copy, import into someplace else, or you can go back to that SQL file that I was just looking at and grab just the states stuff. So if you ever need a states table that you want to tie into, you can steal that one. But what we really have here is employees who take business trips. That's most of what we're looking at. And they happen to work at some plants. So these three are linked together. If we were drawing a picture of this, Remember, this is called an entity relationship diagram. The entities are tables. Didn't introduce you to that. We can't call it a table relationship diagram because then it's a turd and that just sounds bad. So we use an entity relationship diagram. It's an ERD or an ERD. And here we have a bunch of plants and employees and trips. And the way we diagram this, and this really comes in handy when we start doing multi-table queries a couple of weeks from now. One plant has lots of employees, M for many. One employee only works at one plant, at least in our company. One employee takes many trips. One trip is taken by only one employee. If Tyler and Derek both go on this trip, there will be two records in here. One for the trip that Tyler took and one for the trip that Derek took. So this diagram will come in a little bit handier, but it kind of gives you a picture of how things are tied together. And then later on, we're going to tie these tables together using those linking fields that some of you have emailed me about. Use the linking fields to tie stuff together. A couple of you are asking me, how do we link these tables? How do we designate that in the design? You don't. All you do is put in numbers. So if I go to this trips table here, remember one of the commands I showed you in the last unit is select star, meaning every column, every field, every record from TBL trips, semicolon. Here's all the trips. But who's this? How do we know who that is? What that is is a link. It's a number that exists in the employee table. So if I go up here and say, give me everybody in the employees table, somewhere in here, there it is, is Tammy Agent with that ID number. That's how tables are linked. They share a field with common values. Those trips in the, in the, in the trips table are for Tammy Agent. How do I know that? Because the number's there. Well, that's a pain. Yes, when we're doing single table queries, it's a pain because we can't look inside here and easily see who took that trip that had $430 in expenses. Who did that? I can't easily see that. But you'll learn in the next unit, not this unit, how to tie these tables together in an SQL command so that we can say, give me the name of the person who went to Miami for eight days and spent $400. Because next time they go, I want to go with them to Miami. Right. We can't see that yet. 
but we will be able to. And that's the linking part. So what links these tables together is that common field. They both have an emp ID field. And instead of entering Tammy Agent's name in here, we enter her ID number. And that way, if she changes her phone number or if she changes her address or changes her last name, we go to the employees table, we change it in one place, and every one of these trips now refers to Tammy Smith or whatever it is. It's the power of relational databases. So there's no magic when you're building these tables. The magic comes from making sure that the data correlates. And a lot of this isn't done by a database administrator. There's a program, a visual basic program that sits on top of this. When I take attendance, I don't go into a database and type in, let's see, Tim is employer or student ID 12345678, and he was here on this day. Nah. I have a Visual Studio program, or in this case, it's a web-based program that comes up, and I use some very easy-to-use human interface to take role. And behind the scenes, I had to write the program to say, okay, the name's over here, so don't worry about that, but the day goes here, and the class number goes here, and the student number goes here, and I had to figure all that out. Well, I only had to figure out once to write that program. So these databases, what I hope you recognize, and again, our, our role here in systems and teaching you how to do this as networkers, is just to get an appreciation for what's in there, number one. A brief understanding of a little bit of design here and how those things are linked together. It's not all one big, huge, nasty table. And the fact that usually there is some kind of a graphical user interface, a GUI, that sits on top of this thing that makes it a whole lot easier to use. Questions so far? Okay, then back to the notes. We're now going to talk about single table queries. Getting data in is nice. It's important to know how to insert commands. A little later on, if we have time, we'll learn how to update those. But what's more important, it is used on a much more regular basis, is getting the data back out. We've got this employee database with a bunch of tables and a bunch of records. Now I want to start getting some information. We talked about that early in the class, right? What we're looking at here, or on the other screen at least, is data. Doesn't mean much. Okay, I got employees. That's nice. Or I may be linking employee names to their phone numbers is kind of useful to me. But finding out how much money everybody is spending on trips, finding the trips that are very expensive, which city do we go to the most, those kinds of questions, those kinds of information, that kind of information can help us make business decisions. And in order to do that, we've got to pull data out of our query. All of this is based on a language called MySQL. There are other database out, databases out there, Oracle, Access, amongst others. The documentation for this, you don't have a book. If you want to look something up, you can go try that documentation. But like all well-written documentation, uh, you almost have to be an expert at, at MySQL to read the documentation. My advice, my notes. I hope they're a little more English-like. But if you need more detail, I think there's one piece of the assignment to go out and research a function that we haven't talked about. That's where you'd go. So that's a good link. Documentation is good, but it tends to be better documentation after you've got a handle on this and you need some details. The basic query, we've already done a couple of them here, which is basic, it's just a select command. The select is going to appear at the beginning of every one of our queries. Now, that's the command for go get me data, select data. Star represents all the fields. Later on, we'll learn how to substitute our chosen field list instead of all of them in the predefined order. The order is the order that you built them in, in your build command. Instead of getting them in that order, we can rearrange them any which way we want to. And we'll learn how to do that here in just a second. And then from any table name, that will give you every single field, every single record in that table. Very simple to do. I do it a lot just to get a look around and see how it's going. You did it a lot to make sure that your insert commands worked the way you thought. Got an email from Derek and said, chopped off all my numbers. What the heck? Well, by looking inside, you discovered that your numbers are chopped off. And then the next question is, what the heck? And how do I fix that? And he asked the question. I gave him the answer. What a nice guy. I didn't say go look it up at dev mysql. 
I gave him the answer and he solved it. Or gave him a clue and he solved it, let's put it that way. Okay. Most of the time we don't want everything because most databases are huge, hundreds of thousands of records. Think Amazon and all of their customers. Doing a select star from customers would be kind of scary. It would take a while. So we're usually a little more choosy about it. First thing we're going to learn how to do is specify the fields that we want. So let's say that instead of everything, I want a list of the employee's first name, last name, the plant ID that they work in. And we only have four plants here, so maybe we can remember which plants are which. But this plant ID, that's not real friendly, is it? Why don't we just say Coloma, Polonia, wherever the plants are? Why don't we just say the city name? Because the city names are not in the employee table. Let's go take a look at that employee table again. So I'm going to just click up here, and I'm doing control re enters to execute that command. And notice what I have here is I have the employee's ID. Here's the field names. It's good to know. First name, last name, their gender. Here's their plant ID. There are only four. We could go into the plants table and show everything that's in there, and there's four, and each one of them has a city. But in the next unit, just keeping you coming while it's still warm outside. In the next unit, we're going to link these tables together. So we're going to say, don't give me the plant ID. Give me the plant name instead. But there's some magic that has to happen. We're going to save that for the next unit and get some basics out of the way. I got a phone number. Notice those are ugly. They're just 10-digit numbers, hard to read. But again, normally there's a GUI that sits on top of this. The GUI takes that 10-digit number, puts parentheses around the first three dashes in the middle, etc. It does that. I'm saving space in the database by not storing all those characters. Plus, I'm gaining flexibility. How do I know what format my customer wants those phone numbers in? And very likely, on one report, it looks one way, and on a different report, it's supposed to look another way. This gives me the flexibility. When were they hired? How much money do they make? And are they or are they not a union member? Remember when we created those fields that are type Boolean? When you do a describe, they got changed to tiny bits. Tiny bits are just bits, zeros and ones. Zero is false, one is true. So that's how they're actually stored in the database. But we're not limited to describing them that way. So again, my notes, and you know what? I'm going to bring them up in two different places, and this ought to get interesting. So now i got two mices and two keyboards i got to deal with. I'm always going to be grabbing the wrong one, but we'll give it a shot here. I'm just bringing my notes up on the other screen to help me with the discussion here. I don't want all the fields from the employee table. I only want certain ones, so I'm going to do a select. And now you simply list the fields that you want in the order that you want them to appear. Maybe it's because the information you want, you want it certain. Maybe you're going to print this, heaven forbid, and share it with your supervisor. Most of this is like phone numbers and stuff are not really ready for consumption by management. So those GUIs come in again. But we can do it and give them a quick answer as long as they're not too worried about the format. According to my notes that I see on the other one there, I want the employee's first name. So the field name is first name. I can see it underneath. When you're extracting data like this, capitalization is not critical. When you're inserting data, then capitalizing Derek Matuszewski, what did I do? Pretty good? Yeah. Not, not quite right? No, you were pretty good with Matuszewski. Matuszewski, okay. Matuszewski. I would want the capital M and the capital D to show up in my database so when I run the reports, they capitalize right. I would want my state abbreviations to be capitalized. So when you're inserting data, capitalization is important. But once we start extracting, it's case insensitive, so I don't usually get too carried away with capitalization. In my notes, I capitalize all the keywords just to make them stand out. Don't have to do that. I also want the employee's last name and the plant that they work in, and the only thing I have available to me here is the plant ID. And finally, I want to know whether or not they're a union member. And you can just keep going here. Every field has a comma after it. It separates them. The most common mistake is to put a comma after the last one. That doesn't make sense. But commas between, just like in a sentence. And then what I like to do, a couple of people have been asking me in my eval sheets and stuff, it talks about indentation. Did you indent them well so that they're readable? If this starts getting long, there I go reaching for the wrong mouse already. If this starts getting long, what I like to do is just start a new line. 
just like C-sharp, my SQL is blank space insensitive. You can put as many blanks in between here, tabs, carriage returns, whatever. doesn't matter. If you wish, you can indent. I don't always do that. If you break it properly, it makes sense. And the place that I break it is maybe on the from clause. If this list is very small, then I don't necessarily break the from clause. So there's the from. What's the name of the table? TBL employees. And I'm going to break. Going to have to figure out. There's a way to turn this off. Here it doesn't seem to help me much. If you think, I'll try to figure out how to help, how to turn it off. If I can get it turned off, I'll tell you how, and you can choose whether to turn it on or off. And it's a toggle, so you can turn it off as often as you want. Semicolon, so I can have lots of commands on my screen. Enter. And now I get the data that I ask for, and just the data that I ask for. I don't have the higher date, I don't have the gender, any of that stuff anymore. Only what you ask for. So only what you need. You can hide stuff. Works? Okay. That's pretty easy. Now comes the real powerful stuff. Selecting specific records. I'm still getting all, I think there's 50, right? Yeah, down at the bottom of the screen, you can see that there are 50, 300 trips, 50 employees. That's how I know, because I look at that bottom part of the screen, tells me how many rows were returned. And I said, give me the first name, last name, plant ID, union member of all the employees. Well, now I want to filter those. I don't want to see everybody. I only want to see union members, or I only want to see people that were hired after 2010. I only want to see the people working in plant number four. If the data is there, and you can dream up the question, you can get it. You can write an SQL command to get just that data. You can do some very powerful things here. A lot of this ought to look fairly familiar. What's different is notice the select star, and wherever you see a star, you can put a field list in there instead. So I could put first name, last name, union. From the table, and then there's a where condition. Where clause is what this is called. A SQL command is made up of six or seven clauses, all of them optional except the select and the from. There has to be a select, there has to be a from. That's it. Everything else is optional. The where clause allows us to say, only give me the records where this condition, we're going to provide a condition, just like <gasps> if statements in C sharp. And we use pretty much the same commands. Give me the condition where the plant number equals 1, where the higher date is less than 2010, greater than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to. This is not equal to. That's a less than, greater than right next to each other. Many languages use that. MySQL lets you say not equal to using that or that, <coughs> which ought to look familiar. That's the C-sharp version, right? The WHERE clause can also use the keywords BETWEEN. So if we wanted to have everybody who makes a salary between forty dollars and $50,000, we can say WHERE salary between $40,000 and $50,000. When you use the BETWEEN operator, the 40 and the 50 are included. In my programming RDD class, I have an English major in there. She said, well, between means between. It doesn't count the end. Yes, it does. In programming, between counts the endpoints. So if you say between two and four, you will get twos, threes, and fours. So remember that when you're using it. Uh, whenever we're looking at text, we should be putting quotes around them, either apostrophes or quotation marks, either one. I do want you to pay attention to that. My SQL is pretty forgiving. Not all the other databases are. If you forget to put, if you put quotes around somebody's salary, it'll take it, figure it out, and probably give you the right answer. Volker will go, ew, you got quotes around numbers. That's not good. Don't do that. If you leave quotes off of strings, now you're going to have a problem. Dates, we already talked about, right? When you inserted dates, if you put them in this format with the dashes in there, then you have to surround them with quotes or apostrophes. 
If you'd rather not, then you can take the dashes out and just get this eight digit date. Still has to be year, month, day. Still has to be eight digits. You don't need the quotes. I like them because it makes them a little easier to read. Remember from programming logic beginning that we can do compound conditions where this is true and that is true. When we use and, what does that mean? Both conditions have to be true, right? There's also an or, where this condition is true or that condition is true. Give me a list of people whose salary is greater than $100,000 or less than $30,000. Give me the people who are overpaid and the people who are underpaid. If you match either one or both of the conditions, you're in. There is a knot that lets us reverse some logic in C sharp. Remember, it was double ampersand, double vertical bars. Those work in MySQL. Chris is going, yeah, I don't even remember that anymore. It's all right. Got a new set of notes. You can use whatever operation you want. A lot of my programming logic students are using these. I tend to go to the English words because they're a little easier to read and understand. Okay, so this first assignment here, or first task says, list everything for the employees hired between 1997 and 2001. So I want to list everything. Let's select star. All the fields. From TBL employees. And that's nice and short, so I got the from on the same line. I'm a little inconsistent. Depends on my feelings of the day. From goes next or underneath. Doesn't really matter. It works. Where clause, I always start on a new line. And in this case, I want people who are hired between 1997 and 2001. Okay, so I can say where the hire date is, remember the between operator. We're going to do this twice. We can do a between. Now, how would I say 1997? I'd have to start with January 1st of 1997. You cannot do partial dates. There is a way to do it, but it just complicates things. So I'm going to say 1997, and I like the quotes, so I'm going to put the quotes around it. 1997, 01, and 2001. 1231. Semicolon. Check something real quick. On my website, under the assignments, I have given you the result sets for single table queries. Here's the assignment for single table queries. I don't think we're going to get done with this lecture today, so you won't have an assignment with a due date. But my advice, we're running out of time. If you count how many Mondays or Wednesdays we got left after today, there's four Wednesdays left. Okay. So next week I'll be assigning it, which means it'll be due like the week before the end of the semester, but there's still another assignment coming. So my advice is between now and next week, do some of these. You don't have to get the assignment done, but do some. And if you read and said, he hasn't figured, I don't know how to do this, he hasn't shown me yet, skip it. But you can get started, and that way just keep adding to it. And then when we do set a due date, you'll be going, I can do that. Half an hour, turn it, done. But what I've given you is the result set. Here's the answers you should get if you run these queries. Cool. Still got to figure out how to get there, All right? But if you run the queries in the assignment, this is the answers you should get so you can look them up. And if you're not getting those answers, something is wrong. If you are getting your answers, that doesn't mean you're doing it right necessarily. But particularly for this assignment, if you're getting those same answers, you're probably in good shape. You can still make mistakes like putting quotes around numbers. Okay. And it'll work, but I would, I would counter it. You'll lose a half a point for putting quotes around your numbers. So watch for that. But note that the result set is out there. 
on this one, we've got some options, right? Don't need the quotes. Could put apostrophes around it. I don't need the quotes at all. I could, well, we better make sure this works first. Now, remember, there were 50 employees, right? So this should be a subset of that. And down at the bottom, it said 17 rows, just like my notes said. So we got 17 employees, and if we look at the hire dates here, they're all, there's a January 8th of 97. Here's a 2001, pretty much near the end. So 97s, 2000s, 98s, 2001s, 99, looks like it's working. So 17 is my answer there, 17 rows. Remember the other alternative, and I think I can even mix and match this, and this is a terrible idea. So I've specified my first date without quotes, without dashes, and then I switch around and put quotes and dashes around it. Like I said, my sequel is pretty forgiving, 17 rows. Instead of the and, I can use an ampersand. No. Hmm. Oh, sorry, no, not here. The and, the ampersand is used to join two conditions together. You cannot use it in a between. So that one has to stay. And I'm going to undo a couple of times here because this is making me crazy. But I'm just telling you that there are some options here that you can leave stuff out, still get the right answer. And I wouldn't mark that wrong if you have the date format. I might cringe to see one date in one format and the other date in another format. But you got the answer. When database administrators, database technicians write SQL queries, they're not too worried about the format of the program unless they're saving it in a big pile like I gave you today. But if they're just running it to get an answer and they get the right answer, they ship the answer to somebody. Nobody ever sees the question. There's another way we can do this. So I'm going to copy this one. And instead of using between, I can use those logical operators. I can say if the higher date is greater than or equal to 1997-0101, and the higher date is less than or equal to the other one, 2001-1231. That's what between means, right? It's greater than or equal to this one, but less than or equal to that one. So this is a different way of saying the exact same thing. In the assignments, occasionally I specify that I want you to use between. Or I want you to use a logical operator, and, or. Not too often. Again, usually if you can get to the answer, I'm happy. And so are you. Do I get the same answer? Control enter. 17 rows. So often there's more than one way to skin the cats, kind of like programming. A couple different ways to do it. Here I could use, because it's not a between, the ampersand. When you use between, you have to use the word and. If you're using a compound condition, Condition number one, condition number two, and you can use either one, the word and or the ampersands. Very common mistake. This reads really good. Where the higher date is greater than or equal to 1997 and less than or equal to 2001. Reads good, but doesn't work. In this case, I'm getting a red squiggle, syntactically incorrect. You must, each condition must be complete. You must have something on both sides of the equal sign, both sides of the less than or equal to. So in this case, I have to duplicate the higher date. There's no way around that, short of using between, which helped a little bit, right? Or the higher dates between this and that. The other version of this is a little easier to read. If I'm doing betweens, I like between. makes it easy and readable. This one, i got to look at it just a minute. But it says basically the same thing. Okay. Next question says, give me a list of the employees who are not 
working in Polonia, and I have a little cheat sheet in my notes that says Polonia is number two. In the next unit, we'll be able to say not Polonia, and that'll be it. We don't have to guess or try to figure out what the plant ID number is. In this unit, we're not ready for that yet. So I want to display everything from employees. So again, I select star from employees. Where? Might have been better before. Where the plant ID is not equal to. How do I do the not equal to? Exclamation equal. Okay. Two. According to my notes, there should be 37 people. Go. Wrong. Table of employees does not what? Where plant from TBL employees. 37 rows. And if we look at the plant IDs, there's ones, threes, and fours, but there's no twos. Again, you could, so an alternative, do the less than, greater than. They have to be in that order. Same answer. I'm an old VB programmer, so that's the way I lean, because that's what Visual Basic used. But MySQL has been improving itself lately to get itself a little more compatible with all of the languages, like VB and Swift even. A lot of this stuff is Swift compatible. Doesn't matter to you guys, but it matters to the rest of us programmer guys. Give me a list of the employees who are not union members. Hmm. Okay, so here goes another one. And by the way, somebody's always asked me, are you going to save this out there so we can get to it? No. My advice is do what I would do, is keep entering, entering, entering. When you're done, you save it on your flash drive or desktop or OneDrive or wherever you want to put it. And you'll have some examples. Worst comes to worst, you can listen to the recording, because I'm recording this. So you can listen to the recording and look at, find the queries you're looking for in there as an example. I'm doing examples that should come in very handy when you're doing the homework assignment. So I want a list of people who are not union members. So let's just again do a select star, TBL employees, where, and I can see the field name out here, it's union member, union member, maybe, there we go, equals what? Zero. That works, semicolon, and according to my notes there should be eight of them. And notice all the union members over here is zero. So that works. That's okay. Here's another very common technique where it's false. But it's at zero out here. False and zero. Think of false as a constant. Think back to programming logic now. I know you thought you were done with this stuff, right? But think back to programming logic, we created constants, all caps, and then we put a number. Think of false as a constant for zero. Same answer. We could do not equal to true, right? Yeah, you can do that. That works too. Whichever one of those makes sense to you, I'm not going to mark any of those wrong. There's no better way to do it. There, I'll just take that back. There is a better way. I'm going to change my logic here for a second. What if I stop there? Union member is a Boolean field, right? A tiny bit. And I'll use Boolean from now on. It's a Boolean field. It has true or false in it. So what this says is give me a list of all the employees where a union member has true in it. So there were 50 total minus 8, so there should be 42 union, union members. 42. And notice all the ones. So you don't even have to say double equals true. Double equals. <laughs> you don't even have to say equals true or not equals true. I can also do this. Remember in the notes there was a brief mention of the word not. And so you don't even have to say not equals true, you just say not union member. That sounds really good. Works for Boolean fields.
So wherever you have a yes, no, Boolean type field, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to say equals anything. You can just say either give me a list of union members or people who are not union members. That's shorter. With practice, that's what you do. You're not going to get much practice. So if you say equals true or not equals true or zero, I don't care. Give me the answer. Make sense? Okay, we did that display, union members did that, display the employees did that. Okay, a little bit, we'll do one more here. Remember from the notes, or actually from our example up here, that we can use compound conditions, right? And whenever the condition is and, you must meet both criteria. My notes say, give me a list of females who work in Coloma who are union members. Whoa. That's three criteria. Females, Coloma, that's plant number one, union members. You can string together just like you could an if statement. String together as many conditions as you want. Just to make sure you put the correct ones in there. Ors and ands. In this case, they're all ands. So let's try that. Once again, I'm going to say, give me... A list of everything from TBL employees. Where? And when I said give me a list of females who are union members who work in Coloma, it didn't say what information about those people I want. It just said these are the criteria. So if it doesn't say what information, just give me everything. But that I'm not limited. I can show everything and filter on something else. So the first thing was females. So that's where the gender equals F. And now you could just keep going sideways. So I'm going to go underneath so I can see that there are three different conditions. And the plant ID equals 1. Notice the quotes around the F. It's a string. No quotes around a plant ID. It's an auto number field. It's an integer. Don't put quotes around it. It'll work. But I'm not shipping you out of here putting quotes around your integers. That's just not good practice even for networkers. And finally, we wanted to say they're union members and union member. And I don't have to say equals true. You can if, it think, if you think it makes it easier to read. But what I have here is a criteria that says you got to meet all three of these criteria because they're all joined with ands. If there are any one of those, if you're a male or you're working in plant number two or you're working as a manager, you're not going to make the list. According to my notes, there are two. And what did I do wrong? Can't spell employees. If you read the, if you look at this carefully, you'll be all right because this I can expand it. I'm using a very small screen here for recording purposes, but you can click in this and scroll around in it, and it'll say that TBL em, em, employees does not exist. You'll get a fairly decent error message. Two females, plant one, union members. Now, if I was very concerned and I'm giving this to a VP someplace, I want to make sure the answer is right. I'd now go back and list everybody and make sure that everybody else, all 48 of them, all 48 million of them know. <laughs> I just kind of have to, I have to be pretty confident that I'm not going to get bad data here. But you might check to make sure everybody else is okay. Alright, that's a good place for a break, so let's take a break. When we come back, we'll learn some other ways that we can filter data. Mm -hmm.